now that we know something about continuity, we can take a look at one of its applications, something called the intermediate value theorem. We'll start by seeing how the intermediate value theorem is related to continuous functions, and then we'll look at some applications of it to the study of functions. So let's begin with a little example and a question built off that example. Let's say we've got a function f, and here are the only two things we know about it. We know that f of 1 is equal to negative 1, and we know that f of 3 is equal to positive 1. So we know that the two points you see in the graph here are on the graph of our function f, but this is not a complete graph of the function because we're gonna stipulate that f is defined for every value of x. And now the question is, does the graph of f have to intersect the x-axis? Let's see. The answer to our question is no, at least given what we said about our function. For example, f could be this function here, the one represented by this graph. This graph goes through the points 1, negative 1, and 3, 1, the points we had labeled on our previous picture. But notice that the graph never goes through the x-axis. We have a jump discontinuity where x equals 2, and because the graph jumps over the x-axis there, it never actually has to hit the x-axis on the way. But let's modify our example a little bit. Let's prevent what we just saw from happening by adding the additional requirement that our function be continuous. In that case, the answer to our original question is yes the graph would have to go through and touch the x-axis along the way to get from the first point we saw to the second one. So that extra continuity requirement prevents the jump discontinuity that we saw can keep our graph from having to be continuous. So more generally, if we prevent any kind of discontinuous behavior in the graph of our function, then there's no way for the function to go from the point negative 1, 1 to the point 3, 1 without going through the x-axis along the way. So another way to put that is there must be some value of x between negative 1 and 3 where the function value is equal to 0. And the intermediate value theorem basically says that continuous functions are always like this. So let's state the intermediate value theorem. This can look a little complicated, but the idea is just a generalization of what we already saw. Let's say we have a function that's continuous over an interval from A to B. The intermediate value theorem says that for any number you choose, any value Y between F of A and F of B, there's got to be some value in between A and B so that F of C is equal to Y. So here's a little illustration. Let's take a look at the graph of this polynomial function, x cubed minus 2. Notice, by the way, that since this is a polynomial, it's guaranteed to be continuous. There's its graph. You can see the point negative 1, negative 3 is on the graph, and negative 1, negative 1 is on the graph. Now let's concentrate just on the part of the graph between those two label points. y there goes between negative 3 and negative 1. So pick a number, any number you want between negative three and negative one. I'll use negative 2.6. There is the point on the graph where y equals negative 2.6. What the intermediate value theorem guarantees for us is that there's gotta be some x value between negative one and one where y equals negative 2.6, or where f of x, rather, equals negative 2.6. In other words, there's got to be some x-coordinate of that point. Sort of obvious from looking at the graph, but the intermediate value theorem allows us to avoid having to rely on a graph when we are working with this sort of thing. Now, one thing the intermediate value theorem does not allow us to do, or doesn't give to us, 
is the x value we're looking for. We know that there must be one, but the intermediate value theorem doesn't necessarily give us a way to find it. All the intermediate value theorem guarantees is that there is such a number. Let's look at some applications of the intermediate value theorem. One big one is that the intermediate value theorem sometimes guarantees that functions have zeros under certain conditions. This recalls some vocabulary that we might need to review. A zero of a function, called a function f, is a value of x such that f of x is equal to zero. So if you're thinking graphically, then zeros of functions appear as x-intercepts of graphs. So take this example. Let's say we want to show that this function here, defined by the sine of x plus 2x minus 1, has at least one zero. The equation that would find this for us would be sine of x plus 2x minus 1 equals zero. But that's a hard equation to solve. There's not really any good analytical methods to solve that equation. But we also don't need to solve it. Our goal is to show that this function has a zero, but we don't really care in this case about finding that zero, finding exactly what it is. So we're going to do this by using the intermediate value here. We'll show that this function has at least one zero. The first thing to note is that this function is continuous. The reason is because all of its parts are continuous. The sine of x, 2x, and 1 all define continuous functions. And when you add and subtract continuous functions, the result is still continuous. More generally, arithmetic combinations of continuous functions are continuous as long as you don't end up dividing by 0. So the function in question satisfies the condition for the intermediate value theorem. It's continuous everywhere, and so it's continuous over any of its intervals, any of its domains intervals, I should say. Let's look at f of 0. f of 0 is going to be the sine of 0 plus 2 times 0 minus 1, which is just negative 1. Notice that negative 1 is less than 0. Let's take a look at f of pi. That's the sine of pi plus 2 pi minus 1. Sine of pi is 0, so that's just 2 pi minus 1. And that number is greater than 0. So as we let our x values change from 0 to pi and kind of pass through all the x values in between, our function values go from negative numbers to positive numbers. So the intermediate value theorem guarantees that f of x must be equal to zero somewhere in between there, somewhere between where x equals zero and where x equals pi. We can confirm this graphically. Here's the graph of our function in blue. You can see it kind of wobbles back and forth. And you can see labeled on the graph, we have the point 0, negative 1, which we know is on there because we found that f of 0 is negative 1. And we have the point pi 5.283. 5.283 is a decimal approximation of 2 pi minus 1. And somewhere in between those two points, the graph has to go through the x-axis. You can see that happening there at that point labeled 0. But what the intermediate value theorem does not give us is the exact location of that zero. But it does guarantee that the zero exists. Somewhere between zero and pi, f of x must be equal to zero. There are some things to keep in mind about the intermediate value theorem as you're using it, especially in AP Calculus AB. The AP exam will often include questions that are designed to test your understanding of the intermediate value theorem. This is often abbreviated IVT, by the way. When we look at some AP practice exercises, we'll see some examples of problems like these. One thing that you need to remember when dealing with these kinds of questions is that the intermediate value theorem applies only to continuous functions. Now, we know that some functions are discontinuous, but in practice, it's sometimes easy to overlook that. 
And that's because our most familiar experiences of change involve continuous change. So, you know, for example, you never sit there and see an object move from one side of a room to another all of a sudden without passing through all the space in between. The change in that case is continuous. So it can be easy if you're not thinking too carefully about this stuff to forget that functions can be discontinuous. So you gotta be careful. <clears throat> when you're doing calculus, be cautious about this. If you find yourself reasoning about a function and assuming that the function is continuous, ask, you, ask yourself how you know that's true. How do you know that the function is continuous? And if you don't have some kind of good support for that assumption, make sure to think about what happens if it turns out that the function is discontinuous. 